Hello, people. How you doing tonight? <clears throat> Excuse me. I thought I'd just make a quick video. Um, I've got the house to myself tonight. No kids, no missus, nice and quiet. And I've been doing a bit of research lately, and it's weird how I come across this weird research. I go down these rabbit holes, and it's all for me. It's selfish. It's I do want to keep a record, and if anyone's, like I said before, if anyone's interested in it, that's fair enough. But when I go on these wild goose chases with research and go through all these pages and research, I don't just want to forget it. I want to keep sort of record of it nowadays. Because um, lots of times I've opened all these windows, researched for hours, and just closed all the windows and forgot about it. Um, and I want to start keeping note. And this is crazy, guys. Um, it's funny how like serendipitous things happen to me lately. Just weird coincidences. Um, at the end of March, uh, I think it was the 27th, I was working and I got a tip. And it was an old guy. And it, it wasn't that hygienic. I think he was just trying to clear out his house. He was throwing out a lot of alcohol, and um, bottles of alcohol. And I was rummaging through them. And I came across a bottle of whiskey. And I discovered that this whiskey is for the 70s. It's still uh, proof. See at the bottom? 70% proof. That's 70% proof. So this is a bottle of Jura. And this is the stuff I drink, guys. The last time you see me hammered in my kitchen, I was drinking Jura. It was Jura Origins. It was, uh, <clears throat> it was this stuff. It was in my kitchen drinking. It's the new stuff. Well, anyway, I got that old bottle, not realizing how much it's worth. I sent a, a photo of it to one of my mates who's a connoisseur, a whiskey connoisseur. And he went, by the way, Jay, that's 200 quid's worth. And I thought, oh, that, okay, that's good. That's good. Whiskey tip, 200 quid. One of my favorite whiskeys, and it's an old bottle for the 70s. Uh, and a funny, a weird thing was, it was National Whiskey Day. National Whiskey Day. Just to top it off. 
It was National Whiskey Day. I got blue whiskey, my favorite whiskey, and it's an antique. It's eight years. It doesn't age, even though it's from, from the 70s. It could be a 30-year-old bottle of whiskey, 40-year-old bottle of whiskey, but um, they don't age in the bottle. That doesn't make it a 38-year-old bottle of whiskey or 48-year-old bottle of whiskey. It's still eight-year-old, um, but good stuff, good stuff. I'm, I'm sorry stuck whether to drink it or sell it and um, because it doesn't taste better in the bottle over age it tastes better in the cask but not in the bottle so i think i might just sell it anyway guys that's just that's one of the wee coincidences that happens to me like whiskey day and i got a little whiskey for a tip and it's worth 200 quid and just these weird things happen to me and i was sitting watching um there's a game show in britain called tipping point and it's like these tokens fall down this rack and then they, they get pushed. It's a bit like the game uh, the game at the shows that you get where you put the coin down and there's like a thing that pushes all the coins off. Um, so there's this game called Tipping Point and one of the questions was um, who fell in love with their own sculpture of the galley? Sculpture of the galley? And I was like, the galley? And as you know, guys, in my last videos, I've, I've been researching this, the, the Gales, the Gauls, uh, the connection with Galatia and all through Europe, this, this word Gal and Gala. So I heard, I heard this, um, the Galai, and I thought, who's the Galai? Um, so this game show got me on a, I, I got on a computer and I typed in Statue of Galai. And the Statue, the, the Galai were a priest. They were a, a bunch of priests. And they used to castrate themselves and they worshipped the goddess Kabili. Kabili. She's known as the mother goddess or mountain mother. And the strange thing about this, and there's, there's, she's from Anatolia and it's, it predates, it's before Christianity and things like that. Um, and the story of her is that she came down as a meteorite and hit a mountain. Um, she was a black meteorite that hit a mountain. Um, and the story, the story behind her is strange. Like, um, she's got all these priests, the galley that follow, they castrate themselves. Um, but she fell in love with a, with one of these galley. He was called Atis. And he castrated himself at a tree. He, he went crazy and he castrated himself at a pine tree. A pine tree. So the pine cone is a big symbol for this cult. The pine cone that work, that's that symbolizes Atis. Um, so the whole meteorite connection. This is where it comes in me. Islam. Islam's a weird one. When I started like looking into Islam, I just thought, God, that's just another. That's just like Christian Catholicism, or Christianity, or any other Abrahamic religion. It's it's just got the same people. Like Isa is Jesus, and it's got Abraham. It's got all the Gabriel, the angel. It's got Adam, uh, in the Quran, Adam was the first man. So there's a lot of things I thought it looks like maybe a Catholic created this religion. Maybe maybe. Anyway, when it comes to Islam and this Kabili cult, um, Islam. These people, the most venerated site is Mecca. Funny how I said the last time, um, Gala was a bingo here, and Mecca um, is a bingo as well. Anyway, Mecca is a place um, that's sacred to Islam. And there's a black cube there. It's called the Kaaba. The Kaaba. Um, and inside this black cube, all the, all the Muslims go around this cube, they go round and round, and they, they want to get a kiss, they want to kiss what's inside this building, this cubed building, and it's a black meteorite inside like a vaginal shaped metal container, it sits in the corner of the, this cube in Mecca, and all the, all, the, all the Muslims love this meteorite, they love this meteorite, and there's a connection with this meteorite and the cult of Kabeli, from Anatolia and the Greeks and even goes right through to the Black Madonnas. Apparently the, the, the rock was taken and Black Madonnas were made out of this rock. 
So that's how it kind of links in with Catholicism. And it links in with the Kabbalah as well, this so-called Jewish mysticism. And I found an article here, it's, it doesn't seem to be a Jewish thing. It seems to be mysticism and a, a culty religion, but it doesn't seem to be entirely Jewish. Um, but I some interesting things I found. This is how I find them. It's like little things trigger me off. The Galli, and they were priests uh, that followed Cabelli. And she was a mother goddess. And she was like a queen. She was, she was a goddess. She was a mother of the gods. Um, so validation bio like this one. Anyway, guys, I'm going to look at a couple of things. Just get a wee rundown of, because I never had the Cabelli. And there's lots of symbolism. And she was a... Uh, Phrygian, Phrygian, you know, the Phrygian culture, they wear, they wear the, those funny caps, almost like the Smurfs, the Smurf caps are like Phrygian caps, and um, there was a Mithras cult where they killed bulls, well, this cult with Cabelli was similar, they done a thing called Tora Bor Boris, where they killed bulls, or castrated bulls, they covered themselves in blood of the bull, so the bull was worshipped as well, and um, its testicles were worshipped and offered to this goddess. And this goddess, it, it doesn't seem that she, she's obviously a female, but they, they seem sort of homogenous to a certain degree, especially with the whole mountain, the mountain mother. It's like a connection with the ground and the sky. Like the ground's the, the, the mother, the sky's the father. When the sky rains, that's meant to be the male, you know what, water and the female and life grows out of it. So when it comes to the mountains, they seem homogenous, mountain gods. They've, they've got a connection to the, the ground and the sky. Um, and you find this with a lot of these gods and goddesses that they've got aspects of both sexes, uh, male and female. It's a bit like this Baphomet that you see. And like we, us people in these conspiracy circles, we hear about the Illuminati and Freemasonry, and we always hear about the Baphomet and uh, the pentagram and all these other things, but I think they just lead you on wild goose, goose chases. A lot of these symbols are older and rooted in other religions, and they're just being vultured from like older religions. Um, anyway, guys, I'll show you a couple of things. I'll screen share, but I hope you're having a good night. I hope you've enjoyed my last wee. That took me. A, <laughs> didn't take me long to make. It was just a fun little poke at Globusters and their alien rubbish. It's just to show how quick people are to jump on the bandwagon. It was a bit like that Anthony Joshua fight. There's so many people that just jump on the bandwagon. And same with Globebusters. So, as soon as a video comes out, they're jumping on the bandwagon. Orphan Red, Antonio Subarats, they're all jumping on the bandwagon. It's pathetic. So that last video is just a bit of, a bit of fun. Um, I couldn't I couldn't help it. Like. When I heard Bob going blee, blue, 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 and I just thought blue aliens, blee, blue, and I just thought of that song, I thought I kind of let that slide. Anyway, guys, hope you're having a good night. I'm going to share some of my research. And like I said, this is more of a selfish thing. I get little, uh, almost like inspiration to go and research, and I don't just want to let it, let it slide. I want to keep a record there. Anyway. Right, here we go, here's Cabelli. I've heard a lot of people calling her Sabelli, but this is this is another thing that's connected to Easter. Um, the, the character Attis, who she fell in love with and who he went crazy and castrated himself under a pine tree. Um, Attis, this character, he seemed to have done all this at Easter time. He, and I think he gets resurrected as well. So he dies and he becomes resurrected and it's all happening at sorry, Easter time. So I think this goddess, Cabelli and Attis, they are connected to Easter. Um, a lot of people are saying uh, it was to do with Christmas, but it's not Christmas. Attis wasn't born on the 25th of December and all this rubbish. It was the fact that he died as the whole um, fertility aspect, the death and birth life and death and shit like that. It's it's nothing to do with Christmas. Um, but there is parallels between Attis and Jesus and the resurrection. And we all know that Easter isn't the Easter egg isn't doesn't uh, represent a rock rolling past a cave. Come on guys. Remember that story? 
you, you, I remember it being a kid going, what has the eggs got to do with Easter? And somebody saying, or one of my teachers saying, oh, it was a rock that they pushed away from the, when they got resurrected. But we know, guys, that eggs represent fertility. And this is what she represented. Kibeli, this woman here. And she was always um, seated on a throne. This is a more Hellenized version of her. There's there's older versions of um, Kibeli, but this is the usual. She's usually got lions beside her, and she's usually got a crown of um, a fort, because she's meant to be protector of forts, um, nature. Anyway, I'll get on with the, the, the Wikipedia version. Because, like I said, you don't you, you just use Wikipedia as a starting point. You don't use it as initial research. You use it as little clues to get you going where you want to go. But that is a good point to start. Anyway, Kibeli, Phrygian, Mata, Kibelia, 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 mother, perhaps mountain mother, Lydian, Kivava, Greek, Kubian, Kibeli, Kubinin, Kibib. Kibelis, you get you get the picture. As an Anatolian mother goddess, she may have a possible precursor in the earliest Neolithic at Catalhoyuk, where statues of plump women, sometimes sitting, have been found in excavations. She is Phrygia's only known goddess and was probably its state deity. Her Phrygian cult was adopted and adapted by Greek colonists of Asia Minor and spread to mainland Greece and its more distant Western colonies around the 6th century BC. In Greece, Kibele met with a mixed reception. She was partially assimilated to aspects of the earth goddess Gaia, her Minoan equivalent, Rhea, and the harvest mother goddess Demeter. Some city-states, notably Athens, evoked her as a protector, but her most celebrated Greek rites and processions show her as an essentially foreign exotic mystery goddess who arrives in a lion-drawn chariot to the accompaniment of wild music, wine, and his disorderly ecstatic following. Uniquely in Greek religion, <coughs> she had a eunuch mendicant priesthood. Many of her Greek cults included rights to a divine Phrygian castrate shepherd consort Attis, who was probably a Greek invention. In Greece, Kibele is associated with mountains, towns, and city walls. Fertile nature and wild animals, especially lions. And that's why she's got the fruit here. And she's um, towns and city walls. She wears the the crown of this. You see, it's like a fort rather than a crown. In Rome, Cabelli was known as Magna Mater, Great Mother. The Roman state adopted and developed a particular form of her cult after the Sibylline Oracle recommended her conscription as a key religious component in Rome's second war against Carthage. Roman mythographers reinvented her as a Trojan goddess and thus an ancestral goddess of the Roman people by way of the Trojan princess Aeneas. With Rome's eventual he he hegemony over the Mediterranean world, Romanized forms of Cabelli's cults spread throughout the Roman Empire. The meaning and the morality of our cults and priesthoods were topics of debate and dispute in Greek and Roman literature and remain so in modern scholarship. So, quite an important goddess, deity, but we never really hear about her. So, in an Alatonia, no contemporary text or myth survives to attest the original character and nature of Cabelli's frigging cult. She may have evolved from a statutory type found at Catalhoic in Anatolia, dated to the 6th millennium BC and identified by some as mother goddess. In Phrygian art of the 8th century BC, the cult attributes of the Phrygian mother goddess include attendant lions, a bird of prey, and a small vase for her libations. The inscription Mater Cubelia at a Phrygian rock cut shrine dated to the first half of the 6th century BC is usually read as mother of the mountain, a reading supported by ancient classical sources and consistent with Cubelli as any of several similar to tellery goddesses, each known as mother and associated with specific Anatolian mountains or other localities. A goddess thus born from stone, 
She is ancient Frigga's only known goddess and was probably the highest deity of the Friggin state. Right. She's a mistress of animals. Rhea, mother of goddess. Right. From around six, this is in Greece. From around the sixth century BC, cults to the Anatolian mother goddess were introduced from Frigia into the ethnically Greek colonies of Western Anatolia, mainland Greece, the Aegean Islands, the Aegean Islands, and the west westerly colonies of Magna Graecia. The Greeks call her Mater or Meta, mother, or from the early fifth century Cubeli. In Pindar, she is Mistress Cubeli, the mother. Walter Buckert places her among the foreign gods of Greek religion complex figure combining the Minoan Mycenaean tradition with the Phrygian cult imported directly from Asia Minor. In Greece, as in Phrygia, she was a mistress of animals and her mastery of the natural world expressed by the lions that flank her, sit in her lap or draw her chariot. She was readily assimilated into the Minoan Greek earth mother Rhea, mother of the gods, whose rashes ecstatic rites she may have acquired. As an exemplar of devoted motherhood, she was partly assimilated to the green goddess Demeter, whose torchlight procession recalled her search for her lost daughter, Persephone. As with other deities viewed as foreign introductions, the spread of Cabelli's cult was attended by conflict and crisis. Herodotus says that when Anacharsis returned to Scythia after traveling and acquiring knowledge among the Greeks in the sixth century BC, his brother, the Scythian king, put him to death for joining the cult. In Athenian tradition, the city's Metrun was founded around 500 BC to placate Cabelli, who had visited a plague on Athens when one of our wandering priests was killed for his attempt to introduce our cult. The account may have been a later invention to explain why a public building was dedicated to an imported deity as early as source as to the hymn of the Mother of Gods, 362 AD by the Roman Emperor Julian. Her cults most often were funded privately rather, rather than by the polis. Her vivid and forceful character and association with the wild set her apart from the Olympian gods. Gabelli's early Greek images are small votive representations of her monumental rock cut images in the Phrygian highlands. She stands alone with a Nyskos, which re represents her temple or its doorway, and is crowned with Apollos, a high cylindrical hat, a long flowing Shaiton or Chaiton covers her shoulders and back. She is sometimes shown with lion attendants. Around 5th century BC, Agocritus created a fully Hellenized and influential image of Cabelli that was set up in the Athenian Agora. It showed her enthroned with a lion attendant and a Taipanon, the handrum that the Greek introduction to her cult and a salient feature in its later developments. So this is her here on a horse drawn by the lions. Uh, these are interest. This is an interesting story. Right, I'll just read the, the the last part of the Greek part. Conflation with Rhea led to Cabelli's association with various male demi male demigods. Remember what I was saying about them uh, having both aspects. Who served Rhea as attendants or as guardians of her son, the infant Zeus. As he lay in the cave of his birth, in cult terms, they seem to have functioned as intercessors or intermediaries between goddess and mortal devotees through dreams, waking trance, or ecstatic dance and song. They include the armed curettes who dance around Zeus and clash the shields to amuse him. Their supposedly frigging equivalents, the youthful corbants, who proved similarly wild and martial music, dance and song with the dactyls and telkines, magicians associated with metalworking. I think this was um, they protected Zeus from Cronus and Cronus was his dad and uh, the Cronus went to eat him so the I think these dactyls protected him when they bumped in the mountain. Anyway this is Cabelli and Attis. This is this is a dude that has parallels with Jesus at Easter time, not Christmas at Easter. The whole fertility season the whole harvest the death of winter, the birth of spring. Right, anyway, Cabelli's major mythographic narratives attach to her relationship with Attis, who is described by ancient Greek and Roman sources and cults as a youthful consort and as a Phrygian deity. In Phrygia, Attis was both a commonplace and priestly name. 
found alike in casual graffiti. The dedications of personal monuments and several of Cabelli's Phrygian shrines and monuments. So guys, if you're not sure what Phrygia or who, where, where Phrygia is, this is Anatolia, this is Turkey. This is um, Turkey. Phrygia. His divinity may therefore have begun as a Greek invention based on what is known of Cabelli's Phrygian cult. His earliest certain image as a deity appears on the 4th century BC Greek stale fr steel from Piraeus near Athens. It shows him as the Hellenized stereotype of a rustic Eastern barbarian. He sits at ease, sporting a Phrygian cap and shepherd's crook of his later Greek and Roman cults. Before him stands a Phrygian goddess, identified by the inscriptions as Agdistus, who carries a tampanon in her left hand. With her right, she hands him a jug, as if to welcome him into her cult, with a share of her own libation. Later images of Attis show him as a shepherd in similar relaxed attitudes, holding or playing the syrinx, panpipes, and demos on the crown. Attis is a ritual cry shouted by the followers of mystic rites. Attis seems to have accompanied the diffusion of Cabelli's cult through Magna Graecia. There is evidence of their joint cult at the Greek colonies of Marseille, Gaul, and Locroi, southern Italy, from the 6th and 7th centuries BC. After Alexander the Great's conquests, wandering devotees of the goddess became an increasingly common presence in Greek literature and social life. Depictions of Attis have been found at numerous Greek sites. When shown with Cabelli, he is always a younger, lesser deity, or perhaps her priestly attendant. The difference is one of relative degree rather than essence. As priests were sacred in their own right and were closely identified with their gods, in the mid-2nd second, second century, letters from the king of Pergamum to Cabelli's shrine at Pesinos consistently addressed its chief priest as Attis. So here's Attis here. As you can see, there's the Phrygian hat. This is, this is a Phrygian hat. A bit like the Smurf hats that you see. Um... And he's got his crook there. I could go into the whole story with Cabell and Attis, like the whole Greek story, um, about the relationship and how he was born, she was born, but it's, it's long. <clears throat> right, anyway, see if she's more Hellenized here. Festivals and cults, right? Here's the festivals and cults. Magalesia in April. The Magalesia festival to Magna Mater commenced on April the 4th. So that's tomorrow. Well, that's now, guys. Is that now? This is April the 4th now. This is April the 4th now. Well, here it is for me because it's 1.30 a.m. The anniversary. See, there's another. Oh, 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 oh. The anniversary of our arrival in Rome. The festival structure is unclear, but it included Ludi Skyen Nietzsche plays and other entertainments based on religious themes. Probably performed on a deeply stepped approach to our temple, some of the plays were commissioned from well-known playwrights. On April the 10th, our image was taken in public procession to the Circus Maximus and chariot races were held in our honour. A statue of Magna Mater was permanently sited on the racetrack's dividing barrier showing the goddess seated on a lion's back. Roman bystanders seem to have perceived Magalesia as either characteristically Greek or Phrygian. At the cusp of Rome's transition to empire, the Greek Dionysus of Hal Halicarnassus describes the procession as wild Phrygian mummery and fabulous claptrap in contrast to the Magalesian sacrifices and games carried out in what he admires as a dignified tradition, traditional Roman manner. Dionysus also applauds the wisdom of Roman religion, religious law, which forbids the participation of any Roman citizen in the procession and in the goddesses mysteries. Slaves are forbidden to witness any of this. In the late Republican era, 
Lucretius vividly describes the procession's armed war dancers in their three plumed helmets, clashing the shields together, bronze and bronze, delighted by blood, yellow robed, long haired, perfumed galli, waving their knives, wild music of thrum thrumming tampanons and shrill flutes along the route. Rose petals are scattered and clouds of incense arise. The goddess image wearing the mural crown <clears throat> and seated with a sculpted lion drawn chariot is carried high on a bear. The Roman display of Cabelli's Mag Megalesia procession as an exotic, privileged public pageant offers signal contrast to what is known of the private, socially exclusive, inclusive frigging Greek, mis Greek mysteries on which it was based. So here's the Holy Week in March. The Principate brought the development of an extended festival or Holy Week for Gabelli and Attis in March, Latis, Mauritius from the Ides to nearly the end of the month. Citizens and freedmen were allowed to limited forms of participation and rights pertaining to Attis through their membership of two colleges, each dedicated to a specific task, the canophores, the reed bearers, and the dendrophores, the tree bearers. So we've got March the 15th, Cana Intrat, the reed enters, making the birth of Attis and his exposure in the reeds along the Phrygian river, Sangarius, where he was discovered, depending on the version, by either Shepherds or Cabelli herself. The reed was gathered and carried by the, the Cana force. So that sounds similar to the whole Moses being found in his wee basket. Um, March the 22nd, Abor Intrat, the tree enters, commemorating the death of Attis under a pine tree. The Dendrophores tree bearers cut down a tree, suspended it from an in, suspended from it an image of Attis and carried it to the temple with laminations. The day was formalized as part of an official Roman calendar under Claudius. A three-day period of mourning followed. March the 23rd, on the Tubalistrium, an archaic holiday to Mars, the tree was laid to rest at the temple of the Magna Mater with the traditional beating of the shields by Mars priests, the Salai, and the lustration of the trumpets, perhaps assimilated to the noisy music of the corbants. March the 24th, Sanguem or Dies Sanguinis, sanguinis Day of Blood, a frenzy of mourning when the devotees whipped themselves to sprinkle the altars and effigy of Attis with their own blood. Some performed self-castrations of the Galli. The sacred night followed with Attis placed in his ritual tomb. March the 25th, vernal equinox on the Roman calendar, Hilaria, rejoicing, when Attis was reborn. Some early Christian sources associate, associate this day with the resurrection of Jesus. The Mascheus attrib attributed a li liberation from Hades to the Hilaria. March the 26th, 6th, Requietio, day of rest. March the 27th, Lavatio, washing, noted by Ovid and probably an innovation under Augustus when Cabelli's sacred stone was taken in procession from the Palatine Temple to the Porta Campena and down the Appian Way to the stream called Amo, a, tri a tributary to of the Tiber. There, the stone and sacred iron implements were bathed in the Phrygian manner by a red-robed priest, the Quindev the Quinde Chimvri attended. The return trip was made by a torchlight and much rejoicing. The ceremony alluded to, but did not reenact, Cabelli's original reception in the city and seems to have involved, not to involve Attis. March the 28th, Initium Cainae, sometimes interpreted as initiations into the mysteries of the Magna Mater and Attis at the Gyanum near the Phrygium Sanctuary at the Vatican Hill. Scholars are divided as to whether the entire series was more or less to put into place under Claudius or whether the festival grew over time. The Phrygian character of the cult would have appealed to Julio Claudians as an expression of their claim to the Trojan ancestry. It may be that Claudius established observances mourning the death of Attis before he had acquired his full significance as a resurrected god of rebirth expressed by rejoicing at the later Cana Intrat and by Hilaria. The full sequence, at any rate, is thought to have been official in the time of Antonius Pius, but among extant fasti appeared only in the calendar of Philo Philocalus. So this is the Torah Bolium. This is the 
Toro, that's the bull slaying, and Cryo, that's a goat, a ram. They use a ram, so it's a bull and a ram. So bulls and rams are quite um, common symbolism. And the, the shepherd, we've seen the Atis of the crook. Significant anniversary station of participants in the goddess 204 arrival, including our ship, which would have been thought a sacred object, may have been marked from the beginning by minor local private rites and festivals at Ostia, Rome, and Victoria's Temple. Cults to Claudia Quinta are likely, particularly in the imperial area. Rome seems to have introduced evergreen cones, pine or fir, to Cabelli's iconography, based at least partly on Rome's Trojan ancestor myth, in which the goddess gave Aeneas her sacred tree for shipbuilding. The evergreen cones probably symbolised Attis' death and rebirth, despite the archaeological evidence of early cult to Attis at Cabelli's Palatine precinct. No surviving Roman liter literary or epigraphic source mentions him until Catullus, whose poem 63 places him squarely within Magna Mater's mythology as a hapless leader and prototype of our galli. <clears throat> Here's a priesthood. This is a galli. This is what sent me on this wild goose chase, the whole galli. Attis may have been a name or title of Cabelli's priests or priest kings in ancient Phrygia, most myths of the de de deified Attis present him as a founder of Cabelli's Galli priesthood, but in Ser Servius' account, written during the Roman imperial era, Attis castrates a king to escape his unwanted sexual attention and is castrated in turn by the dying king. Cabelli's priests find Attis at the base of a pine tree. He dies and they bury him, emasculate themselves in his memory and celebrate him in the rites to the goddess. This account might attempt to explain the nature, origin, and structure of Piscinius theocracy. A Hellenistic poet refers to Cabelli's priests in the feminine as Galli. The Roman poet Catullus refers to Attis in the masculine until his emasculation, and in the feminine thereafter. Various Roman sources refer to Galli as a middle or third gender, medium genus or tertium sexius. The Galli's voluntary emasculation in service of the goddess was thought to give them powers of prophecy. So we see here, guys, the whole third gender. And we, this is kind of getting pushed nowadays. This whole homogeny, this male, female, third gender. And these, these guys were voluntarily ripping their balls off to be these priests, the Galli. Pessinus, site of the temple whence the Magna Mater was brought to Rome, was a theocracy whose leading galli may have been appointed via some form of adoption to ensure dynastic succession. The highest ranking gallus was known as Attis and his junior as B Batex. The Gaia of Pessinus was politically influential in 189 BC. They predicted or prayed for Roman victory in Rome's imminent war against the Galatians. Galatians, there's the galli again. The following year, perhaps in response to the gesture of goodwill, the Roman Senate formally recognised Ilium as the ancestral home of the Roman people, granting it extra territory and tax immunity. In 103, Abatex travelled to Rome and addressed its Senate, whether, either for the redress of impieties committed at its shrine or to predict yet another Roman military success. He would have cut a remarkable figure with a colourful attire and headdress like a crown, with regal associations unwelcome to the Romans, yet the Senate supported him, and when a plebeian tribune who had violently op opposed his right to address the Senate died of a fever, excuse me, or in the alternative scenario when he prophesied Roman victory came, Magna Mater's power seemed proven. In Rome, the Galli and the cult fell under the supreme authority of the pontifex who were usually drawn from Rome's highest rank and wealthiest cit citizens. The Galli themselves, though imported to serve the day-to-day -day workings of the goddess cult on Rome's behalf, represented an inversion of Roman's priestly traditions in which senior priests were citizens expected to raise families and personal respons responsible for the running costs of their temples, assistants, cults and festivals. As eunuchs, 
Incapable of reproduction, the Galli were forbidden Roman citizenship and rights of inheritance. Like the Eastern counterparts, they were technically medicants whose living, dependent, whose living depended on the pious generosity of others. For a few days of the year during the Megalesia, Cabelli's laws allowed them to leave the quarters located within the goddess temple complex and roam the streets to beg for money. They were outsiders marked out as Galli by the regalia and their notorious effeminate dress and demeanor, but as priests of the state cult, they were sacred and inviolate. From the start, they were objects of Roman fascination, scorn and religious awe. No Roman, not even a slave, could castrate himself in honor of the goddess without penalty. In 101 BC, a slave who had done so was exiled. Augustus selected priests from among his own freedmen to supervise Magna Mater's cult and brought it under imperial control. Claudius introduced the senior priestly office of Arch Archigallus, who was not Enoch and held full Roman citizenship. The religiously lawful circumstances for Agallus' self-castration remains unclear. Some may have performed the operation on the Dias Sanguinis, Day of Blood, and Cabelli's Anatus March Festival. Pliny describes the procedure as relatively safe, but it's not known at what stage in their career the Galli performed it, or exactly what was removed, or even if all Galli performed it. Some Galli devoted themselves to the goddess for most of their lives, maintained relationships with relatives and partners throughout, and eventually retired from service. Galli remained their presence in Roman cities well into the empire's Christian era, some decades after Christianity became the sole imperial religion. St. Augustine's new Galli parading through the squares and streets of Carthage with oiled hair and powdered faces, languid limbs and feminine gait, demanding even from the tradespeople the means of continuing to live in disgrace. Um, so, it's quite, it's quite a lot of stuff here. Quite, you, you need to actually look for some YouTube videos of this Cabelli cult. Um, there's some good ones out there. Cabelli's major myths deal with their own origins and their relationship with Attis. The most complex, vividly detailed and lurid accounts of this myth were produced as anti-pagan polemic in the late 4th century by the Christian apologist Arnobius. For Lucretius, Magna Mater symbolised the world order. Her image held aloft signifies the earth which hangs in the air. She is the mother of all, and the yoked lions that draw her chariot show the offspring's duty of obedience to the parent. She herself is uncreated and thus essentially separate from and independent of her creations. In the early imperial era, the Roman poet Manilus inserts Cabelli as the 13th deity of an un otherwise symmetrical classic Greco-Roman zodiac. So obviously there's 12 in the zodiac and they threw in Cabelli in which each of the 12 zodiacal houses represented by particular constellations is ruled by one of 12 deities, known in Greece as the 12 Olympians, and in Rome as the De Consentes. Manilius had Cabelli and Jupiter as co-rulers of Leo, the lion, in astrological opposition to Juno, who rules Aquarius. Modern scholarship remarks as Cabelli's Leo rises above the horizon, Taurus the bull sex, the lion thus dominates the bull. Some of the possible Greek models for Cabelli's Megalonesia festival include representations of lions attacking and dominating bulls. The festival dates coincide more or less with the events of the Roman agricultural calendar around April the 12th when farmers were advised to dig their vineyards, break up the soil, sow millet and curiously apposite given the nature of mothers, priests, castrate cattle and other animals. So... That's that's a little taster of Cabelli. And here's another article I found, the Cabelli cult. The, Cab the Cabelli was the great Phrygian mother of the gods, goddesses and motherhood, fertility in the mountain wilds. Her orgiastic cult dominated the central and northwestern regions of Anatolia and was introduced to the Greece via the island of Samothrake and the Boeotian town of Thebes. Cabelli was identified with a number of Greek goddesses, including Rhea, mainland Greece, Demeter and Samothrake, 
Aphrodite on Mount Ida and Artemis in Caria. In sculpture, she was depicted as a matronly woman with a turret crown seated on a throne flanked by lions. The orgies of the meteor Theon. Orgiastic festival. So it was sex. It was sex. It was like a sex cult. But this is um this has got tons of strabo and um, where where this great mother is mentioned. There's lots of articles when she was this, this is all the different cults in Attica, so then Greece cult anyway I'll, I'll have a look at this one. Right, what was this called? The Irish Origins of Civilization. This is web page. Atonism and the cult of Mithras. So this is connected to the Phrygian. Thou hast saved us by shedding the eternal blood, Mithriac Adage. We are forced to conclude that Saul and Victus Mithras in Christianity were not two religions in competition, as we often read, but were two institutions of a different nature that were closely connected. This is particularly a certainty, Flavio Barberio, the secret society of Moses. Antonism has adopted strange guises throughout the long ages since it was born and has subsequently expunged from Egypt. As revealed in my books and sites, Antonist elements are conspicuous in Judaism, Chaldeanism, this is Scottish, I think, Chaldean, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism, as well as in Masonry and Templarism. I've also shown that Atonism was a corruption of Druidism and Aminism, the ancient stellar theologies. Apologists for Judaism and Christianity, Christianity habitually demonize Judaism and Aminism in their works. This is inevitable given their skewed perspective of world history. Regardless of reg regrettable prejudices which often serve to mar their works, a few authors inadvertently provide us with the excellent insights into how perversions of solar worship such as at atonism spread throughout the world in early times. In this section, I provide excerpts from the book entitled Terror and the Illuminati by David Livingston. This book deals with the spread of the supposed Persian cult of Mithras. This cult, of which Saul and Victor's cult was a variant, was prominent during the period of Roman imperial expansion and rise of Christianity. Unlike Mr. Livingston, I am convinced the strange solar sect or cult was little more than a call for atonism. In my reading of Hellenistic and Roman history, Mithraism and Anatism are merely two names for the same ancient cabal, both alluding to the dragon court or brotherhood of the snake that is, has its origins in the pre diluvian epoch. Of even greater importance is the fact that the cult of Mithras was in fact the cult of his mother, the goddess Cabele. So here we go, guys from whom we get the terms Kabbalah and Kabbal, meaning secret society, known throughout Europe, the Levant and Asia, numerous guises and names. She was probably the most important goddess figure of antiquity, particularly to those within secret enclaves. So, the goddess Kabele with Atonis lions and circlet or wheel. So the circlet or wheel guys, remember this, the wheel. Cabelli with her lions and her wheel. Her primary emblem connect Canaton, the everlasting cycles of necessity and fate. The name of the most ancient Egyptian goddess, Tort, also connotes a circle. The twin lions also stand for our male cubs, our archonic offspring that we recognize as Jesus and Satan, Alpha and Omega. St. Edward's chair, our so-called coronation chair, upon which British monarchs are crowned. Elizabeth II sat upon this chair when she became the Queen of the British Empire. Note the four lions at the base of the chair symbolising demagogic Cabele and the cult of her name. And this is where the Stone of Destiny goes as well, guys. The stone from Stone of Schoon, the Scottish one, where all the royals have been coronated on, goes inside this chair, right, th right in this space. So, the Kabbalistic tree of life isn't of Jewish origin. The term Kabbalah is a variation of the name of Kabele, goddess of the mysteries. Here's a statue here of the Mithras cult, the stabbing in the bull, 
serpent. Um, the famous image of the Phrygian cap wearing solar hero Mithra slaying the bull. The image is purely Atonist. The bull symbolizes the Amonists in the old astrological age of Taurus. Apparently, the split between Atonists and Amonists was serious. The Atonists, as we can see, wanted to emphasize their violence and superiority. In any event, what we call monotheism is simply the result of the stripping away of wholesome traditions for spurious reasons. The God worshipped by Christians and Jews today is merely the concoction of one psychotic king, his priests and descendants. The Phrygian cap became a seminal symbol of the original 18th century revolutionary cells and parties that violently brought the old world to ruin. These anarchistic and insurrectionists group were and are controlled by powerful Luciferian Antonist societies operating outside the public view. There's old, our old buddy Baphomet. The term Baphomet may connote Mit, Met or Mithras. In this case, the term donates initiation into the cult of Mithras, Kabele or a baptism into the same. The goddess behind the god is suggested by the female breasts. Readers familiar with our work on the Irish origins of civilization will understand the connection between the Egyptian, Roman and British Antonists and how they gained converts and worked to secure the great but incendious world order. Livingston traces the all-important connection between the Antonists, or as he refers to them, Judaic or Davidic bloodlines and modern royal dynasties. He deals with the elite houses of Orontid, Herod, Sinclair, that's a Scottish one, well, it's Norman, it's some French Scot, Saint Clair, Sinclair, Angevin, Lorraine, Guy's Welf, Brandenburg, Hasburg, Merovingian, Mar Mar Carolingian, Stuart and Plaginet, etc. Of great interest were the connections between the Jewish Herod family, Roman Caesars and Templar Merovians of France and Scotland. Mr. Livingston's book is technically dry and written. He expects his readers to be familiar with the vast majority of his information. I hope, therefore, that the following experts fairly summarise the salient points of his important work. So this is David Livingston's stuff. It's, I'm not going to go through it all because there's tons. The Cult of Mithras, the Comangini, the Mithraic bloodline, Caesar Augustus, that's my favourite beer. Uh, Emperor Caligula, Caligula and Herod, the Amian dynasty, St. Paul and Mithraism, France and the Merovingians. Mariv Mariving Jesus Christ. Rulers all over all. Charlemagne, the Merovingian, <laughs> the Sinclairs, the Templars of Scotland. Here we go, the Sinclairs. Templars of Scotland, Rosalind Chapel, Escape of the Templars, the Order of the Garter, Sinclairs and Rothschilds. So I could go through all this slowly, guys, and you can just pause it and read it um, afterwards. But it's quite interesting how it all has a connection to this cult. Um, and I, I don't think it ever went away. I think the Romans took it on. It's, I think it started in Anatolia, probably spread to Greece. Then the Romans took it and changed it, adopted it, put it into Catholicism. So it's, it's, all, it's all hiding there in the symbolism. And one last thing, guys. This is how it links to Britain too. Remember the wheel. Remember the lion. Remember this goddess. Who else does this goddess remind you Yo, Britannia, isn't that like Cabelli? And even the shield, this isn't a shield, this is the wheel. This is definitely the wheel. It's not a shield, it just looks awkward as a shield. And she's wearing the Corinthian helmet. Britannia with a Corinthian helmet and the Greek robes. Um, and the lion by her side. This is definitely a representation or another form of this Kibeli. And it's connected to all the Abrahamic religions, just like most pagan beliefs.
they're, they're sort of intertwined with the Abrahamic faith. Anyway, guys, this is just a, a tiny, tiny wee bit. Um, I'll stop screen sharing now. So, guys, this is that's, that's just be skimming, but I want you to have a look and uh, see what you can find. But I could go deep into it, but she's actually connected. Cabela is connected to a meteorite, a black meteorite. And this black meteorite and black cube, and it's connected to Saturn and Cronus, and and it, it sends you on some goose chases, but even the Jews wear the black cube on their head or wrap it around the wrist. They worship the cube. Um, interesting stuff, guys. Anyway, this is for my own research purposes. If you've watched this and stayed with me and watched live, thanks. But um, this is mainly for my own record keeping of my thoughts. Anyway, guys, thanks for joining me. I'll see you another time.